on Tuesday, June 12th, 2012, Katakawa Games and Grasshopper Manufacture, with the help of now Hollywood heavyweight, but at the time of game release, very weird and semi-obscure indie movie writer-director James Gunn, released the very bloody, very action-heavy, and very, um, skin heavy hack and slash zombie fighter extravaganza titled lollipop chainsaw to xbox 360 and ps3 on tuesday june 12th 2012 i had just finished my first year of middle school excited for summer but not excited for eighth grade i was still in high hopes that puberty would fix all the social slash physical hang-ups that made me feel not only insecure about myself but also straight up repellent to the girls i had crushes on 10 years later i can tell myself that no in fact it didn't get better, but I did in fact get over it. Hello there internet, how are you on this beautiful day? Today we're talking about a game that I have so many weird feelings about, but before we get into said feelings, if you're new here and not aware of how this YouTube channel works, let me fill you in. I have quit playing video games, but I don't want to stop playing them. So, I've decided to complete every game I own to the best of my ability and then talk about all my experiences with said game, past and present, while also giving you, the viewer, tips, tricks, and insight so that you can enjoy the game I've said goodbye to. And Lollipop Chainsaw is a wild game to say goodbye to. So, uh, a little on topic, a little off topic, but I have a legitimate question. Why are major games released on Tuesdays? Is that, is that like a... Is that like a coincidence or is there is there a, a reason? Oh, oh God, this is going to destroy me. Give me a second. One eternity later. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That, that was a journey. So apparently it's a pun by Sega for the release of... Uh, Sonic 2, like, like Sega wanted to release the game globally on, on the same day, so they decided to call it Sonic Tuesday. Tuesday. You get it. And it was a tradition that, that kind of stuck and kind of didn't stick for other game companies. The power of Googling. Random things. Um, but... What, 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 what's this about, about Lollipop Chainsaw? So, statement of the year, uh, my adolescence was a strange time. All it really taught me to do was hide myself from everybody I liked and disliked because I told myself that if I didn't, then they would just end up hating me. And I think the worst part about being so young with so much to say and no where and no one to say it to is that you just kind of feel cocooned inside yourself. Uh, I have many odd memories of middle school because I remember trying so hard to be who I know I was and also just fighting that feeling with everything I had. But, uh, but, but here I am now on the interwebs talking about a game I'm sure 80% of viewers forgot existed. That percentage is a, is a complete guess. I mean, you're watching this video, aren't you? Uh, Lollipop Chainsaw is a very odd game in my repertoire, mostly due to the fact that before starting this channel, I had owned it for a very short amount of time, but always kept it in the back of my train of thought since its initial release in 2012. I remember the buzz around the game when it was coming out. I mean, I was a, I was a seventh grade boy and everything about the marketing of this game screams seventh grade boy. So obviously it caught my attention, but sadly I had no means to play this game. I didn't own an Xbox 360 or a PS3 and I wouldn't own one until my birthday a few short weeks after the release of this game that party coming with its own very weird, very complex emotional baggage. Lollipop's Chainsaw has strangely been popping up in and out of my life for the last 10 years. I remember in high school when a friend of mine told me that her, a girl, and a friend of hers, also a girl, play and love Lollipop Chainsaw. I remember in 2019 watching an Instagram Q&A with James Gunn where he was asked if he would ever direct a video game and he brought up the fact that he already did and that game was this game. And I remember one time while I was checking out at a GameStop, the cashier was talking to another GameStop employee about something and they brought up the notion that a character from Lollipop Chainsaw shows up in one of the Guitar Heroes, which prompted me to ask if they had Lollipop Chainsaw in stock. Uh, the first GameStop employee said, I don't know, probably not. And then I asked, could you check anyway? And he was like, ugh, fine. He typed the title into his system and to the luck of me and the begrudging responsibility of the employee, they did in fact have it in stock. Dang it, that 
I didn't mean for that to rhyme. So, with a game that had always figuratively held my curiosity being now literally held in my hands, I walked out satisfied. But sadly, I didn't play Lollipop Chainsaw that day, or that month, or that year. I played it when a Peruvian beanie had chosen its fate for me to say goodbye to a theme that will become ever so apparent as this channel continues on. Now, as I stand before you, having fully played and completed this game, you may be asking yourself if I may be asking myself if Lollipop Chainsaw has lived up to my expectations slash curiosity for the past tenth of a century, and the answer is... I'm not sure. Lollipop Chainsaw is an oddball, and I absolutely adore that it lets its freak flag fly, but what I think I admire more about the game is how audacious it is in its own audaciousness. Honestly, if I could boil this video down to one sentence, that sentence would be, Dude, this game is just fun. This game is so bombastically ridiculous in its approach to everything that I can't help but just admire it. The colors, the outlandishly silly story, the way things just like happen with no explanation. It's all fantastic. It also doesn't feel like random stupidity because the game explains what's going on very matter of factly. Like yeah, there's three dimensions. Magic, zombies, and zombie magic are all real and Juliet's chainsaw is also a phone. Duh. It, it honestly feels like more like a Looney Tunes cartoon than anything else and I love it for that. The best compliment I can pay this game is that it stands in good company with all the other media sloshing around in my head at any given time. That media also being as weird and crazy and fun in their own ways. All this means is that all the things that people enjoy about this game remind me of all the things I enjoy about people. And as you will see later in this video, I will discuss that media that holds good company with this game. And much to the disagreement of a very well-respected and loved friend of mine, I'll be discussing that media in depth. Lollipop Chainsaw is so beautifully audacious that it really has no equal when comparing its weird approach to itself. But weirdness is an ocean, my friends, and as soon as you think you've found the deepest depths, you will soon find that you can always dive deeper. That being said, I, I also d don't really have that much to say about the game itself because, well, this game is, is kind of the definition of style over substance. Uh, it, it, it's all sparkle and no shine. There, there's just not much here to talk about, and it disappoints me because I, I couldn't really think of a gimmick for this video in terms of grounded unifying through line. This game is a, is a compact, explosive joyride, but crumbles in a mess of themes and references with really no emotional weight tying it to anything. I don't really think that this is the type of game that would quote unquote change anybody after playing it. This game just is. And that's really the mindset that I think you should enter this game with. Everything in it just is. It, it doesn't really mean anything, and it doesn't really have to. This game scratches that seventh grade boy itch so perfectly that it doesn't need to change people. Do you think that you would like everything in this image? Then you'd probably like this game. I genuinely believe that there's no reason that some things should be more of something than something else. But I also don't think that that should take any value away from said things. Did... did that make any sense at all? Maybe? Good. Okay, are we all on the same proverbial bloody zombie boob page now? Perfect. Then without further ado, on to the video. Booting up Lollipop Chainsaw gave me a very specific feeling. A feeling that this game will be different. The insanely colorized, stylized, visually visualized graphics that lay out the main menu jumped onto the screen and screamed, Yo! Are you ready for chaos? After staring at that for about a minute, the screen then turned into a cutscene. And this reminded me that a very popular trope in the late 2000s to mid 2010s, a period that will be very prominent in my video game collection, was when you booted up a game and idled on the title screen, either the opening cutscene or a special animatic would play. I loved and love these little videos, especially Lollipoop's Chain Fence. 
I realize that I am going to say lollipop chainsaw about a billion times in this entire video, so I'm gonna spice it up from now on. Lollicramp Crimcraw was a game that falls into the former category, having just the opening cinematic play, but I will get into my love for this very specific cinematic later. But for right now, we are focusing on the gameplay, the playing of the game for the games sake. The zombie slaughtering, chainsaw wielding, boyfriend hip accessorizing, head cheerleader we come to love and play as through the surprisingly short runtime of this game goes by the name Juliet Starling. Juliet being voiced by the voice of a thousand voices, Tara Strong. Dude, if you don't know who Tara Strong is, just look her up and you're going to see how many characters she's voiced. It's like, yeah, him, what and them too. Oh my god, and her? It doesn't stop. Juliet being a character with a lot of... Character. Okay, alright. Okay, alright, listen. I think Juliet actually does have a lot of character um, besides her assets. I enjoy Juliet. Like, I adore how confident and positive she is all the time. And I also adore how this confidence and positivity starts to erode her and Nick's relationship. We'll get into how I find Juliet to be more than boob candy in a later section of this video, and how I think that her and her decapitated confidant work so well together, but we can save that for later. For now back to the now. Most of the questions uh, we can have about Lol Slam Chimchar can be explained simply by our main girl. Juliet being a part of a zombie killing family, which is apparently both a normalized problem enough to make it a profession in this world, and a season enough practice to have there be trainers and different styles of zombie slaughter. Juliet falling into the tried and true chainsaw style of zombie killing. I love the sentences this game makes me say. Also, uh, for contemporary reasons, uh, here's a list of other things that are just real in this world. Um, magic, both spells and incantations, multiple thematically relevant realms, funk-based arcade aliens, giant elephant motorcycle robots, flying thrash metal viking ships, hallucinogenic school bus chicken atrocities, sexist punk rock slander word dodging. I could go on. This world is spectacularly crude and funny and weirdly self-aware to the point where any random thing that just happens, both you and the characters just accept it as reality. Like, oh yeah, of course. Of course I'm just fighting a guy in a chicken costume with a baseball bat right now. Or like, of course, there's a giant birthday cake made out of dynamite and I can't let the fire zombies touch it or else the school will explode. I love the sentences this game makes me say. Lily Lick Chop Shop is a game categorized in the hack and slash genre of video games. If you're not familiar, hack and slash games are very straightforward in their approach to gameplay. Sometimes uh, you'll be hacking, sometimes you'll be slashing. It's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. The one thing a lot of hack and slash games have in common is that the controls are always very easy to pick up and get more complicated through time. The controls in this game, however, are very simple and for the most part, they stay that way. If we bring up an Xbox 360 controller, I'm not gonna go through all the controls because I don't like to assume, but I'm sure everyone listening has played a video game before. If you haven't, then I apologize for assuming. All you really need to know to get through this section of the video is that your light attack is X, your big attack is Y, and your super attack, or as I like to call it, the mick hit, is right trigger. I'm also using Xbox prompts because I played this game on my Xbox 360, and if you used PlayStation, then the PlayStation equivalent will apply. You can only activate the mick hits after the rainbow blood meter in the right hand corner has filled to full capacity. Once it has, the song Hey Mickey by Tony Basil will begin and every zombie we touch becomes a cranial firework, letting us rack up instant kills. The main goal of the gameplay is to get the player more adept and proficient in the art of zombie killing. And when killing zombies, the game wants slash instructs you to use light attacks until the zombies become stunned. Usually they sit on their knees and have cartoon birds circle their heads and instantly chainsaw their heads off with heavy attack. However, there are many different ways to do this. More on that shortly, but the game will start rewarding you for using methods that kill multiple zombies at once with a coin multiplier. Also more on coins shortly called sparkle hunting. I, I don't, I don't know why it's called sparkle hunting, but 
Dang it if I'm not overjoyed that it is. This is how the game wants you to play it, but there are a few caveats, and before I dive into said caveats, I have to explain something I may or may not have explained before. I usually only play video games on the hardest possible difficulty because in my head, I think that's the best way to experience any game in question. I love me some difficulty. Well, a better way to put it is I love me some feeling of overcoming some difficulty. The point is, is that I have a second sense for figuring out ways to get through quote unquote hard gaming sections. The quote unquote easy way. See, an ability you are given at the start of the game is a drop kick. Uh, you can achieve a drop kick by simply jumping with A and hitting light attack with X. A drop kick will throw any zombie you wish in the direction of the kick. Additionally, if you land a direct drop kick on a zombie next to a wall, this will cause the living corpse to careen into said wall and leave them vulnerable for a direct kill. And part of me speculates that this is how the game was intended to be played because there's an achievement titled Juliet 51 that requires you to land 51 direct drop kicks in reference to Suda51, this game's director. It's just too easy of a way to kill these zombies. But when killing them, the kicker is, pun definitely intended, and yes, you are welcome, the kicker is not all zombies are created equal. Most of said zombies play and behave the same, but the differences they share are just beautiful. We have, in order of appearance, <coughs> Student zombies, elderly zombies, hazmat zombies, bomber zombies, cop zombies, basketball zombies, teacher zombies, rocket zombies, punk zombies, firefighter zombies, football zombies, cheerleader zombies, baseball zombies, pitcher baseball zombies, flying zombies, geek zombies, breakdancer zombies, metalhead zombies, and finally chicken suit bird man zombies. Each of the specific types are represented by 35 superpowered named zombies that are expected to be collected in the zombie album. Why does everything I say rhyme? Now, six out of these zombies are the bosses we encounter throughout the game, but the other 29 are a version of one of these zombies I just listed, but stand as a harder variation. The differences between the named and unnamed being, they have a name, obviously, a visible health bar, and are significantly stronger than normal. And yes, later on I will go through each zombie type and how to defeat it, but we'll get into that in a second. When named zombies fall by your hand, they are unlocked in the zombie album. This album gives us the concept art for these zombies, accompanied by their specific written backstories, most of which, um, <laughs> most of which I can't read here because I want my videos to be monetized, but if you love stupidly ridiculous juvenile teenage humor, then read them if you would like a laugh. Uh, I tell you all of this to say that the fastest and easiest way to kill any named zombie is to drop kick them into a wall and then immediately slash them with your chainsaw. They have a shorter recovery time than regular zombies, but if you time it right, you can't miss. Now, you may be asking yourself, what is the purpose for this cavalcade of campy chaos? What do I gain from killing these zombies? Well, my surprisingly articulate friend. The answer is points and medals. Our points benefiting our overall score at the end of each stage and medals benefiting our wallets. See, the points are calculated by how we complete the stage, giving us an overall score for each individual task that then gives us an overall score. You remember school? It's just like school. We're graded on how many zombie medals we got, both gold and platinum, our sparkle hunting record, our completion time, and we get a 500 point reduction for every time we die and restart. This is all tallied up to give us our grade. Our total points are also shown on a leaderboard at the end. This is both a real leaderboard showing us how everyone around the world has done, as well as a fictional leaderboard showing us how well our in-game family has done. Our father having the highest score on each level, and we get an achievement and collectible every time we beat his high score in every stage. There's also an achievement for just registering one of your scores on each level to the world leaderboard and I was really tempted to get the high score on each level but I ultimately decided against it because these videos already take long enough to make. Now medals are even more important because this game has an entire game pay to play mechanic directly affecting how you gain power ups and combos. During the story section of this game you can come across random ramshackle computers that you can use to shop at chop2shop.com, sadly not a real website, 
Uh, pro tip also, if you ever need more money, just attack vending machines, lockers, or trash cans. They always got coins hidden in them. The money mechanic in Lollipop Chainsaw is probably the most tedious part of an otherwise tedium-free game. Here's why. There are two types of medals we can collect. We have gold medals we get for zombie killing and getting points, and then we have platinum medals we can only get one of two ways. We can either sparkle hunt, the bigger the multiplier, the bigger the platinum reward, the largest sparkle hunt I ever got was times seven, or we can just buy them straight up from the store for 500 gold medals for every one platinum medal. Platinum medals being used to buy inconsequential but very scenery chewing items like New costumes, concept art, or extra music. The most expensive items um, the game asks the player to buy with these platinum medals are Juliet's costumes, and these costumes are probably the most um, revealing part of the game. Uh, the more expensive the costume, the more skin is shown. And these are honestly just decoration, and they don't do anything to the story, many of them are just different versions of the same revealing, oh my god, you have more weapons than clothes on right now type clothing. And there are also uh, anime costumes from popular anime at the time if you want Juliet to uh, look like one of your favorite anime girls. Just for the record, uh, my favorite costume was the giant bunny rabbit outfit because in its cutscene, sometimes uh, it's still on and the camera pulls in for a dramatic shot on Juliet, and it's just a giant deformed bunny head, which, no notes, good stuff, good stuff. The gold medals gatekeeping also includes more important things like lollipops, which act as both healing items and collectibles. Uh, we can either find lollipops scattered throughout the world and they heal exactly half of our health for one use, or we can find golden lollipops hidden extra hard around the world and they add to our album collectibles. We also have Nick tickets, which we use to activate the various Nick-related zombie stunning shenanigans, all of which involve using your poor boyfriend's head to pummel zombies with. Power-ups, which come as permanent buffs in the form of food, dumbbells, and energy drinks, all of which add to Juliet's stats, giving us more health, making us stronger, making us react quicker, etc, etc. And finally, combos. This game's combo mechanic is a lot more frustrating in retrospect than it is in actual gameplay. The entire reason for that being simplifies down to I had one question burning in my soul after this game, and that sole question was, why are the combos like this? See, when you first start playing the game, you aren't aware of what you can't do simply because you haven't done it. The game gives you simple instructions and easy tips, and you're like, cool, rad, thanks game. But then as you progress, you go to the store and think, huh, I need to save up for all these stat upgrades because I want my health slash strength slash speed as high as it can go. Why would I need to buy more combos? I mean, what I'm already doing is working, right? Oh, oh, you are so, so wrong. See, combos, or as the game likes to call them, awesome skills with a Z, welcome to 2012, are very, very important when clearing out large portions of zombies, especially the heavy chainsaw combos, especially, especially the holy chainsaw. If you want your multipliers to skyrocket late game, this combo is a necessity. It gives you four wide chainsaw slashes in a row with a circular finisher. Another amazing combo is when you lock on to an opponent. Lock on is also really important, but very self-explanatory. And you use the jump stab, you are automatically locked onto them. So when you jump and mash your chainsaw, you hit them like four or five times in the head with a heavy chainsaw attack. It, it, it slaps. But if you're dumb, like me, you won't get it until after you finish the game because it costs a thousand gold medals and the jump stab costs 280. The only reason I got any of the combos at all was because I wanted to complete my little completion section of this video only then to realize that the combos were helping the game exponentially. You see, instead of discovering the combos naturally or buying the tutorials for them, we have to buy them wholesale. This is a really odd choice to me and maybe it's because I haven't 
seen this unlock new combo style in hack and slash games before. I think the idea of hiding new mechanics and movesets behind experience points or collectibles isn't uncommon in the very least, but in this game it just feels odd. Again, I don't find this to be a problem only because it made the game less enjoyable after I finished it, and honestly it was my fault in the first place, and if you start buying them sooner I'm sure you'll have a better time, um, as if bloody chainsaw zombie dancing wasn't enjoyable enough. Uh, also, also, um, in the main menu, if you want to see how to do any of the combos, um, you just have to hit the tab, how to cook zombie, and when you get all the combos, you unlock an achievement called Master Sushi Chef, implying that zombies are the fish in your chainsaw sushi mastery. I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I love the sentences this game makes me say. Speaking of the chainsaw, our titular weapon gets its own set of upgrades throughout the story as well. However, these are naturally occurring, except for the Nick ones. The chainsaw goes from just your average everyday magical zombie killing chainsaw to a phone in which Juliet's received calls from her friends and family, a scooter which she uses to dash across city streets and rooftops, a straight up gun, a cannon she uses to shoot her boyfriend's decapitated head with. I love this game. Also, uh, just a little cherry on top of all the other cherries. The chainsaw's official title is the Bedazzled Chainsaw. <laughs> and, and again, I, I think that's just wonderful. The call mechanic is really only used as small, unskippable cutscenes that serve as brief respite and hints from the supporting characters. The scooter mechanic, um, or the aptly titled Chainsaw Dash, has its own specialized sections in certain levels, playing kind of like a kart racing game in which you rack up the minimum amount of sparkle hunting, which is three. Um, then you obtain the Chainsaw Blaster, uh, which is just a gun, you know, you get it. You can also um, only get a maximum of three sparkle hunting if you hit three zombies in the head in a quick succession. There is also an achievement for landing headshots with the blaster, so watch out for that. Um, you'll know you landed a headshot when their heads fly up like bottle caps. Praise be this game. Okay, so uh, uh, now that we now that we know all about that, let's get into the fastest way to kill these zombies. Uh, remember 1,225 words ago when I said that I would go through all 29 zombie variations and how to kill them? Well, I meant it, and if you have to question whether or whether not I'm actually going to talk about them, then I don't think you fully grasp what this channel is yet. Okay, ready? Speed round, let's go. Uh, we have the titular student zombies that can be put down in a handful of pom-pom punches and a swipe with a chainsaw. The elderly zombies aren't anything to sneeze at because they usually attack in pairs and are faster, more aggressive, and use their abilities as a fighting advantage. I audibly sighed every time they showed up. A swift drop kick chainsaw swipe never failed to ease them from my sight. The hazmat zombies are wildly annoying, mostly due to the fact that they can carry around canisters that will explode when thrown, and they aren't afraid to throw said canisters when things aren't going their way, but after they do, they aren't difficult to decapitate. Bomber zombies have one MO blow you up, so you just have to hit them away from you, whether that be a drop kick or a chainsaw swipe or even simple pom-pom punches. Regardless, they explode out of your way, but be warned, some of them have mastered the ability to run. Cop zombies shoot at you with guns. Get close, and they become toast, as NWA said. <laughs> Basketball zombies and their point guard counterparts, um, they only show up during the basketball mini games in stage one and two, and they all die in like one or two hits. But the point guards are much, much harder to kill, and really the only reliable way I found to kill them is with the Mick hits. Teacher zombies are just student zombies, but faster and can pick up desks. Rocker zombies have guitars. Moving on. Punk zombies are scrawny little pushovers that can easily die with a handful of pom-pom punches, just like regular punk rockers. Fight me in the comments. Firefighter zombies are no joke. They have axes and do not go down easily, but they still go down. They get staggered when combos are thrown their way. Football zombies will charge at you in an attempt to knock you down, dodge their chances, and hit their backs. Easy peasy. Cheerleader zombies can dodge your attacks, but are generally weaker than most variations. Uh, wide swipe attacks can cut them down like weeds. The baseball zombies, both the basic variation and the pitcher variation, love to throw baseballs your way from a distance and rarely do they miss, but besides that, they don't stand out from the normal fare. The flying zombies... <laughs> 
hold on. I, I have to take a second. Oh my god. Okay, so, um, the design of the flying zombie is... It, it, it's just perfect. Like, the gimmick is, is that their legs got cut off and, and then the blood flowing from their wounds is so powerful that it propels them in midair, giving them the power of flight. Mwah. Perfect. Beautiful. No notes. Um, they're killed with one hit from the chainsaw blaster. Back to the speed round. The chicken zombie is a giant zombified chicken, and they are not at all easy to kill. I found a steady combination of the chainsaw blaster and heavy attack combos brought them down the quickest, but watch out for their charge attacks because they decimate. Geek zombies aren't to be pushed around. They throw Molotov cocktails at you, and they are not easy to catch. However, they are very easy to kill once you do catch them. Breakdancer zombies sometimes hold stereos that cause the other zombies around them to increase in power and speed up, so just take out the zombie with the stereo and you take out the power. They really only appear late game. And lastly, but not leastly, uh, Chicken Suit Birdman Zombie, uh, his name... His name is Jack, and Jack only appears in ranked mode and attacks you when you try to activate the chop to shop stands. He wields a baseball bat and loves to try and smash his way through your face, but he can be handled with a few light combos. Uh, there, there, there are some other uh, little notes I want to touch on before we get into the stages. Um, for example, um, there's a, a handful of quick time events in the game. I think they're just a product of when this game came out. They're really self-explanatory. Uh, after you fight the other giant chicken zombies in stage three, there's a three-headed chicken bus monster zombie that shows up. I, I, I've got nothing to say about that. It just kind of happens. Um, finally, just a reminder, all this information is based on the hardest difficulty, so easier difficulties will probably be different, but only in terms of how hard you hit zombies and how hard they hit you. Um... Oh, yeah, mildly important. Students, uh, periodically throughout the game, you will be tasked with helping out your fellow students who are about to be killed by zombies. School pride. These encounters are ruled by two kinds of scenarios. The first is when you see a student in peril about to be eaten by a zombie, you have a limited amount of time to save them, and the other is when you encounter a student that you have to guide to safety. In the former, you'll either be clearing a swarm, shooting from afar, or just making sure no zombies hurt the student screaming for your help. But if you fail, then that student will dramatically die in front of you, and you won't get their bus load of coins. However, when you're trying to guide a student to safety, swarms of zombies will come to attack said student, but if you try to intervene between them and their next victim and succeed in saving the student, you will be rewarded with a large amount of gold coins, but if you don't, then you will be rewarded with a stronger zombie in place of the student that you once tried to save. That is all in terms of basic zombies we have to deal with, but in terms of non-basic zombies, we have five very powerful non-basic zombies in the game that are called the Dark Purveyors. Uh, the Dark Purveyors are five powerful, very characteristic zombies that act as the bosses for each level. Each Dark Purveyor also having the ability to counter Juliet's attacks, making them extra super tough when fighting. The first time I fought a Dark Purveyor, I died almost 30 times because my technique of dropkick zombie decapitation would not work. So I felt Zed's tight pant punk rock wrath to its fullest extent. Um, also his second phase confused me. Like, was I supposed to destroy all the amps or, or just the big amps or, or am I just supposed to dodge? I had no idea. But now I know that the answer is you're just supposed to destroy the amps he's on until there's none left. Um, uh, you, you know you've succeeded when the giant amp falls from the sky. The other bosses all have their own unique quirks, uh, but none of them really give you that hard of a time. Um, if you progress naturally, uh, i.e. if you buy upgrades combos and stay stocked, I did not, so I had a tough time. But but that is, of course, until you get to the final boss, not Killabilly, by the way. He's, he's a whole other thing. I'm, I'm of course talking about the motorcycle maniac himself, Lewis Legend. So we don't really know anything about the boss's backstories besides um, what it says in their description, so I can't really give this guy a proper intro. But what I can say is that this guy is not a joke. He is fast, he is mean, and he has five boss stages. 
five boss stages. Dog, Carnegie Hall only has three stages. Lewis Legend stages do not quit. Each stage is faster and meaner than the previous stage. He goes from a crazy rock star on a motorcycle with a guitar that is also a gun, or I guess a gun that's also a guitar, both are interchangeable, to a giant elephant robot mech, to a smaller, but still giant, giant elephant robot tank, to a giant elephant motorcycle tank with arms, to just a motorcycle tank. It's a whole thing. However, funny enough, uh, the stages in any boss fight never felt like impossible. By that, I mean they always felt completable. Like they were supposed to be fun and minimally challenging and not completely off the wall difficult. Some things are more tedious, however, uh, seeing all bosses having achievements attached to their boss fights, and most are a variation of do X X amount of times. Um, like you have to counter Zed's electric balls 15 times or counter Lewis's elephant smash 10 times. Vikey's is a quick time event that you only have to hit once. Uh, Mariska is don't get hit by her balloons. Josie is the easiest because all you have to do is wait until the last 10 seconds to kill him. Honestly, you could get all these achievements by accident. There's uh, an end game boss. <laughs> I mentioned earlier, there's, there's an end game boss called, oh my God, thank you, Suda51. There's an end game boss called Kill a Billy who is just the entire stage onto himself with the final fight against him throwing everything the game has thrown at you so far all in one go. But it really is more about stamina than strategy, so I feel like you can handle it on your own. Honestly, it's the stages themselves you should worry about more than the bosses. All the stages have their own achievements attached to them as well. Um, on top of the previously mentioned point grades, every single stage has these little mini games sprinkled throughout, and those mini games have their own attached achievements. And again, they're all a different flavor of do all of blank or get all of blank with or without doing blank. Um, sometimes you're playing basketball with zombie heads, sometimes you're using your chainsaw as a scooter on a school rooftop to collect coins, or sometimes you're just farming. It's always different. But unlike his boss fight, Josie's stage achievement took me way too long to get. No Fear of Heights is an achievement you get in stage four right before you go up and fight against Josie, the funk alien underwear zombie. And throughout stage four, there are many, many games you must participate in because stage four takes place in an arcade and, and you're in a video game, you get it. The last mini game you play has you ascending the tower in a gondola with zombies throwing random things down from above and you have the ability to shoot pixels to destroy said things. It's like Space Invaders meets Brick Breaker. The catch is you can only unlock No Fear of Heights if you go through the mini game without using the aforementioned pixel shooting mechanic and this achievement by far took me the longest. It took me 23 tries to finally get this achievement. Listen, I make it sound a lot worse than it is. It's not horrible. It took me 45 minutes. Was it annoying? Yes. Was it impossible? No. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that covers everything about the gameplay. Um, Lolly Slam Klim Clark is a is a very fun game just to control. It's it's uh, funny, just like its namesake. It it feels like candy to play. Like like it's easy and it it makes you feel good, but but too much of it just just uh, just gets you tired. One thing I will never get tired of, however, is this game's story. I really like the story of this game. I may have mentioned that. Going into it, I had a feeling in my heart that this story would be a very wild ride. When I first started playing this game for this channel and I idled on the home screen, as I previously mentioned, I watched the opening cutscene and I found myself with a very large smile on my face. Not because of the blatant sexuality of the freshly not a child main character, but because of the gosh dang level of charm this game emanated from every frame. The dialogue, the shot composition, we will talk about the overt sexuality in a separate section of this video. Everything about it was so charming and fun, and we will talk about the overt sexuality in a separate section of this video. But I think this story both is and isn't more than what it sets itself out to be. A 
I'll tell you what I mean in a second, but first let me explain what I don't mean. I use the fandom wikis for the games I play a lot for these videos. They are insanely helpful when organizing my thoughts into something resembling coherent while writing these scripts. I'd love to sit here and tell you that I'm a genius savant who can remember everything he sets his eyes on, and while I do have a strangely selective memory, I think of it more like taking notes in my brain than just remembering things, but when it comes to things I'm working on, it is sparse at best. The Lip Crank Chick Sip fandom wiki is very helpful when it's talking about the specific names and explanations of certain things and characters. When looking at the pages for the Dark Purveyors, I found that close to the bottom was a little section titled Symbolism. Me loving a little symbolism, saw this heading and immediately went, ooh and started reading. The writer of this section goes on to explain that each boss has a different symbolic meaning in accordance to the main antagonist of the game. The main antagonist being a very goth, very dramatic, very edgy sadist named Swan. I haven't mentioned him until now because he has exactly nothing to do with the gameplay, but he does play a very big part in the story, and this author is speculating that each dark purveyor is a different manifestation of what Swan wants himself to be. Now, you may be asking yourself, but wait video boy, shouldn't you be saying all of this in the theme section of the video? Well, dear viewer, if you pay attention, I'll explain. Dang! You want me to, you want me to chew your food for you too? Huh? All these questions. I will turn this video around. I will never discourage, discredit, or dismantle anyone's enjoyment, interpretation, or enlightenment with whatever they love. I want people to enjoy things however they want to enjoy them, and I think the person who wrote these paragraphs about the Dark Purveyor's symbolism in accordance to Swan's deeper wants and needs really, really enjoys this game. And I like to believe that they're the same person who holds the worldwide high scores on all the stages, and I have no proof in either direction for that statement, it's just my headcanon, but I don't think this game is as deep as this person theorizes. Maybe this person is seeing something I'm not, but this game doesn't feel like a complex, convoluted, symbolic game. Again, however anyone wants to enjoy themselves, have at it. But I just think of this game as a lot more simple, and I think that there is beauty in that simplicity. You see, I think this game's depth doesn't come from the ideas it puts forth, but rather it comes from what this game tells us about ourselves. And I think that the story is a perfect way to tell us that. I think that there are very random and blatant references but I also think that they're just that. Random and blatant. Honestly, I think that Suda51 just really likes putting things he thinks are cool into his games. Like, why does Juliet's dad look like Elvis? Because Elvis is cool. Why are all the dark purveyors seemingly from different time periods? Because it's cool. Why is there a cheerleader running around with a chainsaw mowing down zombies like it's her sworn destiny to do so? because it's cool. The random bombastic nature in which instances are put forth really seem to have no rhyme or reason, but they fit so perfectly well. And the story is the beautiful pot that all these ideas are mixed in. All the bloody, zany, campy ideas. I think that with all that out of the way, we can finally get into the story of Lolly Pimp Chimp Slap. Interior, bedroom. Morning. We open in the bedroom of one Juliet Starling. You see, today is Juliet's birthday, her 18th birthday to be exact. Juliet is a cheerleader at San Romero, good reference, high school, and she has a secret. A secret she hasn't even told her boyfriend, Nick, who happens to be waiting for her at school. After a shower and a realization that she's late, Juliet hurries out the door. On the way to school, she starts to see that a lot of people seem to be walking around very funny and resemble a certain type of undead creature. Juliet then concludes Concludes that these people don't resemble the undead because they are the undead. She then jumps off her bicycle and branches a giant, sleek, and ever so sharp chainsaw. Juliet makes her way to school, helping all the students that she can, mowing down all the zombies that she can, until she makes it to Nick, who has just been swarmed by zombies. But sadly, Juliet is too late. Nick gets bitten. With his dying breath, Nick gives Juliet her birthday gift, and Juliet with tears in her eyes, holds Nick as he slowly succumbs to his zombification. And that's the end. So, the story about this- No! Okay. Juliet proclaims that there's something that they can try, so with determination, she revs up her chainsaw, and with a quick, I love you, she slams the chain down on Nick's neck. 
Nick wakes up in Juliet's arms and he's elated to be alive until he realizes. Yep, Juliet done cut Nick's dang head off and performed a, and I quote, magic ritual so that he can be alive without a body. Nick is not pleased about this, but Juliet chooses to look at the positives. Nick also asks how and why Juliet knows zombie decapitation rituals, and Juliet admits to her BF that she is a ZH, a bona fide zombie hunter. After clearing the room of the undead dweebs, the pair see explosions go off all around the school, so their new goal is to escape. I'm not really sure how they got to the school in the first place, but as my grandma always said, don't ask too many questions about zombie cheerleader boob games. And she taught me how to play solitaire, so I'm rolling with it. They kill some teachers, jump through a bus, destroy some fire zombies while chainsaw stripper dancing. You know, the usual. Juliet then tells Nick that they need to find Morikawa Sensei because he'll know what to do. They find Morikawa Sensei, who also happens to be the school's chef. Side tangent. I love everything about Morikawa Sensei's character. From the hat, to the exaggerated Japanese accent, to his perverted perviness. Listen, is Morikawa Sensei a walking stereotype? Yes. Was he created by the people who that stereotype is based on? Yes. Do I care about either of those two facts in accordance to each other? No. I love him. Morikawa Sensei tells the duo that the universe has three dimensions. The land beyond worlds, i.e. heaven or nirvana. The rotten world, i.e. hell or Twitter. And our dimension, Earth, i.e look outside. And the dimensional walls between the rotten world and Earth have been opened with, I quote, a combination of black magic and explosives. I love this game. And because of this break, the gases of Rotten World have turned everyone into zombies. And the only hope they have to close the gate is to stop the bomber. That didn't really make any sense, but we're moving on. They decide to split up with Morikawa straight up phase shifting into the courtyard and leaving Juliet to go to the cafeteria. While at the cafeteria, they evade a bomb cake. You wanna see some bomb cake? Here's a bomb cake. Uh, 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 sorry, I, I, I blacked out there for a second. They evade a birthday cake made out of bombs and explode into the courtyard. And there they meet Swan, a morbid, moody, murder teenager who is the one planning to open the gates between worlds. Swan summons five evil spirits called the Dark Purveyors and tells each of them to destroy a part of the school. Morikawa Sensei jumps in to stop him only to get mortally wounded. Juliet then is forced into a fight with the punk rock zombie named Zed. After Zed proves that words can hurt and there is no such thing as an amp too big, Juliet gives him a good old bifurcation and a soul-sucking portal into the sky. Morikawa Sensei stumbles back into the scene only to congratulate Juliet and tell her that the dark purveyors have taken over the school and he tragically dies in Juliet's arms. Don't leave! Oh, I have this for you, Juliet. Only after giving Juliet her, her birthday present, of course. His soul then gets into the elevator to the land beyond worlds and departs. Our titular tag team move to the stadium where they find a flying Viking ship powered by a drum kit that controls lightning. <laughs> Dude, come on! Powering this thunderous drum set is Viki, the next of the dark purveyors. And Juliet notices that climbing Viki's ship is Cordelia, the oldest of the Starling sisters. Cordelia notices Juliet and floats down a birthday present, but it lands on the school's rooftops. After grabbing the present, no surprise, a gun, and shooting some zombos, Juliet finds the Viking ship floating in the school's pool. They meet up with Cordelia, and after a few introductions, Juliet manages to get onto the Viking ship. A fight ensues, Viking gets cut in half, and then that half gets decapitated, leaving just his head, which then, of course, morphs into a giant head, and then finally, that head gets cut in half. Without a drum pedal pumping pilot, Viking's ship loses control and crash lands onto a farm, where we meet Juliet's younger sister. Rosalind driving a bus. And just as quickly as she arrives, she drives off in said bus. Nothing of story significance happens until Juliet cuts a mushroom in half and falls into a hallucination where she fights giant chickens. She then leaves the hallucination and finds herself on a tractor. I will repeat the above paragraph because that's exactly what happens next. Nothing of story significance happens until Juliet cuts a mushroom in half and falls into a hallucination where she fights giant chickens. She then leaves the hallucination and finds herself on a tractor. 
Juliet meets back up with Rosalind to find that she's been possessed by Marishka, the next of the dark purveyors, who then drives Juliet and Nick into another hallucination. Marishka reveals that she has kidnapped Rosalind and forces Juliet to fight for her sister's release. Juliet does this and wins, but after the fight, Juliet wakes up in the field next to Vicky's ship. Wait, so, does, wait, does that mean that, that everything was a, was a hallucination in this stage? Well, regardless, this leaves Juliet confused about Rosalind's whereabouts. Until a call comes in from a mysterious auto-tuned voice saying that he has kidnapped Rosalind, and if Juliet doesn't meet him at the arcade, the youngest starling sister will be seeing stars in death. Boom threat received. After Nick and Juliet simultaneously realize that A, it's a trap, and B, they have no other choice, a motorcycle rides up and on the saddle of that machine steed is none other than Gideon Starling, Juliet's father. Juliet's dad gives them a ride to the arcade and when they arrive, they devise a plan of attack. Juliet enters in the front while her dad climbs up the building from the back. Juliet fights her way up the building, having to beat zombies, video games, and video game zombies, until she reaches the top where she finds a funk-filled fiend by the name of Josie, the next dark purveyor. They fight only for Josie to beam up into the ceiling. Juliet follows, and the top of the arcade then turns into a giant UFO. That UFO starts going through a hyperwarp. Juliet disables the ship and kills Josie, freeing her youngest sister. And with the help of her father, Rosalind lands safely. All three of the sisters meet up, and with the help of their dad, they devise a plan to take out the final dark purveyor. The plan works out, and they find themselves at an unfinished chapel with the last dark purveyor hiding beneath. Gideon Rube Goldberg's a hole into the floor, and Juliet drops down. Juliet meets back up with Swan, Remember Swan from like the beginning of the game? Who taunts them. Then they are introduced to the final dark purveyor, Lewis Legend. And after a very long, very tedious, and very elephant robot heavy fight, Lewis Legend dies. Juliet then turns her chainsaw onto Swan, who reveals that killing the dark purveyors was part of his plan all along. You see, in order to fully open the gate to Rotten World, all the dark purveyors had to be sacrificed. Juliet asks Swan why he's doing all of this in the first place, and we find out that Swan has been bullied and ridiculed by everyone in school except for Juliet. And when Juliet started dating Nick, Swan snapped. Swan shoots off his own head and by doing so transforms into a giant deformed, also Elvis looking zombie with a very accurate feeling name. Killabilly. With both the world and Juliet slash Nick's relationship falling apart, they have to move fast. They get a call from Morikawa Sensei, calling from the land beyond worlds, and he tells them that they have to get close to Killabilly. Juliet fights her way through downtown, but gets caught by the giant zombie monstrosity. They fight until Juliet wears Killabilly down enough to get a call from Morikawa Sensei, telling her that his weakness lies inside his body. Juliet tries and fails to enter the beast, and just as she's about to get killed, her father jumps in the way and sacrifices himself to save his daughter and provide her an opening. Juliet and Nick make it to Killabilly's heart where Swan's body has connected itself. Morikawa Sensei then tells them that the only way to kill Killabilly and close the gate to Rotten World is to connect Nick's head to Swan's corpse and force Killabilly to self-destruct, killing Nick in the process. After a heartfelt conversation, Nick agrees and Juliet connects his head and gives him a goodbye kiss. The plan works and Killabilly self-destructs. Nick then finds himself floating in the cosmos with Morikawa Sensei telling him that because of his sacrifice, the Glorious Ones have granted him a second life, but there was a small mix-up when giving him his body back. Nick awakens back in our realm and runs to hug Juliet only to discover that his head has been put on Morikawa Sensei's body. We then see that everyone, including Juliet's dad, is okay, and they all run off into the sunset to Juliet's house because Juliet's mother is still waiting for them. But when they get there, Juliet's mom turns out to be a zombie. Ah! Well, that's of course the uh, the bad ending you get if you if you didn't save all the students in peril, and if you did save all the students, then uh, you get the good ending where where Juliet's mom is fine and everybody gets birthday cake. Yay! Fade out. I really like the story of this game. Uh, I may have mentioned that. The story feels so zany and off the wall and any other Nickelodeon style words that I can think of that it just warms my soul. I especially love how Japanese the story is, even though it's set in the US. Like the appearance of the, oh God, 
Ashtadegajis. 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 I dare you to say that five times fast. Holding up the world, or the inclusion of all the sushi recipe zombie combo blends, this game's story seems to be a Japanese interpretation of American stereotypes through the lens of a hack and slash zombie apocalypse. I love that I have a channel where I can say sentences like that. I mention the story as it stands doesn't really hold a lot of weight in my mind besides that of being awesome. Not too insulted of course, it's just not as meaty as other stories. I love the characters and their caricature characterizations. I love the over the top cartoonish everything, but they feel designed to be empty. Like, they feel intentionally one-dimensional. Like, Juliet is the hot girl who keeps asking if her butt looks fat, and Morikawa is the horny old Japanese man, or Swan is the dramatic, moody, goth teenager. Funny enough, Nick is the only character who genuinely feels like a real dude. Because all of his responses and reactions are completely genuine to the stupidity of the situation. He's the straight man to this entire game's funny man, and he's literally just a talking head. I wish I could really find more to say about the story besides how enjoyable it feels. It, it, it doesn't feel lifeless, but it also doesn't feel filling. It, it's, it's like a weird medium. It, it's like brunch. Th this, this story is like brunch. It, it's something you have to hold you over to get something bigger. Honestly, I, I don't think I would have remembered or thought about this story if I had played it back when it first came out, and I don't think the creators necessarily wanted you to remember it. I think they were just having fun writing it, and I don't think it needed to be more than that. You see, Lip Prop Chin Stop was written by Mashihiro Yuki, a person with only three other credits on IMDb besides this game, all of which directed by Suda51. However, there's another writing credit on this game a name you may have heard once or twice before. James Gunn. Now, if I dig deep down in my soul, I think the reason I love this game's story so much is because this game's story is a celebration of the weird. And I think a huge part of that is because it was at minimum co-written by a human being who revels in the weird. Listen, I will use any excuse I can to talk about the things that I love. And I know that this game wasn't directed by James Gunn, even though in an aforementioned Instagram Q&A he claimed otherwise, and honestly for all I know he did, he'd know more than I would. However, I still want to go off on a side tangent, and perhaps, perchance, a side essay within this essay? A double essay, let's say. Also, this uh, is the part of the video that my good friend told me not to do, but, um... This is my channel, Oliver! Okay? I will sneeze on your Legos. I love you, Oliver, with all of my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you... I can't exactly recall the first moment I was introduced to something that James Gunn did. You see, when I was just a reckless youth growing up in the middle of nowhere, I was obsessed with movies. Specifically about anything that had a lot of blood or profanity or crude gestures and humor. I was a weird kid. I didn't like shows made for kids because I didn't want something to speak down to me. I had felt that the kids' shows lacked this feeling of depth that I couldn't quite explain back then. Luckily, however, I had an older brother. You see, my older brother had a TV in his room that had a built-in DVD player that was like the coolest thing to me. And when I was five or six, I remember my 16-year-old brother watching the 1999 action thriller pseudo-satire Fight Club. And just watching the opening credits, I was entranced. I loved the dark tones and the speeding, impossible motions. I, I couldn't get a hold on what exactly I was even seeing, let alone trying to understand what madness was brewing its way inside my head. Eventually, my brother told me to leave the room because he didn't want his infant younger brother watching what violence would soon occur. Shortly after, however, he decided, or I begged, or maybe I even just stumbled upon, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, a DVD that my brother owned. It had these wild cartoon eyes staring ominously forward, almost like the person who owned those eyes was threatening or trying to stare a hole into the person holding the DVD case. At the top were a pile of words that read, 
Family Guy presents Stewie Griffin, The Untold Story. On the back was an obese man in a bathtub with a much thinner ginger-haired woman, along with three pictures that depicted very odd scenes, presumably foreshadowing the contents of the DVD. I was transfixed. I was curious. I, I had never seen anything even remotely like this DVD seemed to be. So, I put the disc into the cool hybrid DVD TV. I was hooked. The crude jokes, the violence, the cynicism. It's been almost two decades, and to this day, I can tell you every word, every joke, every scene of these three episodes of Family Guy. But this DVD unlocked something so much deeper. It unlocked the floodgate of media. I was obsessed. Before I was 10 years old, I watched all the existing episodes of Family Guy, Futurama, Robot Chicken, and South Park. Not to mention the shows I watched and didn't finish, and not to mention all the movies, because honestly I couldn't even ballpark the number of movies I watched in hoping of fulfilling this need. I wanted more. More of what I wasn't entirely sure, but I knew two things. First was that all this stuff I was watching filled me with something deeper than joy or inspiration. And two, that Blue's Clues and Teletubbies weren't going to cut it ever again. So I searched and I clamored and I bowed at the feet of this newly discovered idea that movies, music, TV shows, everything didn't have to be G-rated. It didn't have to talk down to you. It could be weird or angry or violent. It could be crass and it could be free. And it seemed like in my young mind, the adults around me were taking this idea for granted. I could see that I, a young child, should not be consuming and understanding this media the way that I was, but because I was, I felt like I was a scientist who discovered a new element. I was like a spy infiltrating and gathering information on this idea that seemed to be everywhere. Sadly, however, I didn't exactly have a lot of um, friends to share my findings with, and the ones I did have didn't uh, really appreciate um, this stuff like I did. Uh, for example, in second grade, I, I showed my friend Seth the movie Juno, and, um, well, he, he told his mom... And she got angry, and uh, she didn't let me and Seth hang out anymore. Also, fun fact, the first time I ever uh, saw Twilight was at Seth's house, so um, I'm not saying anything when I say that. I'm, ju I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying. But, but Seth's mom not approving of us nine-year-olds watching a movie about a pregnant teenager just proved my point that adults were hiding amazing viewing material from us children. Uh, the only downside, well, downside in quotes, was that the kids around me mostly listened to their parents uh, when they told them not to watch something, so uh, I was basically telling them, hey, disobey your parents so that we could watch something weird. And listen, while I say all of this, I totally understand not every child was me, and I'm not putting myself above the other kids around me or even their parents. I'm just trying to say that not all kids are going to react to media the same way, I understand that parents worry that their kids will see something that will scar them or scare them or worse off, something that they want to replicate. So I get it, Seth's mom. But what I don't get is that you also let Seth watch insane amounts of horror movies at the same time. Like, come on, lady. You let Seth watch Sleepy Hollow all frickin' day, but as soon as I want to watch a tongue-in-cheek comedy about the struggles of teen pregnancy, suddenly I'm the bad guy? Um, this love for off-the-wall media followed me my entire adolescence. And I always kept a tuned radar to whatever TV show, movie, or video game may be bloody or brood enough for my sensitive tastes. So one day, I was scrolling through Netflix, probably thinking about how cool I looked in combat boots and fluffy socks, until my little adolescent eyes saw a very interesting movie cover. Huh. A movie called Super. Presumably, it's about superheroes. 
I like superheroes, thought my flannel shirt and I. But why does this movie look so... weird? I recognized Rain Wilson because my brother loved The Office, but here he is in a makeshift thrift store superhero costume. So I looked up the trailer on YouTube. Oh, yeah, uh, um, this, this, uh, this story is set in a time before Netflix had the trailer on screen ready to go. Dog, this story is set in the time when Netflix was just a single screen. G girl, this story is set in the time when Netflix as a media viewing platform was still a crazy new thing. I remember when Netflix was a company that just sent you DVDs through the mail. And it still does. I'm not joking. You can still do that with Netflix. Oh my god, random thought moment. Do you remember Gamefly? They had commercials scattered all up and down my childhood. Do they, do they still exist? <gasps> they do. <gasps> what? You can actually buy consoles from them now? Wait, what are we talking about? Super. Okay, so uh, I watched the trailer and this movie checked all the boxes. Absurd amounts of violence? Check. Crude, over-exaggerated dialogue? Check. Off-the-wall moments like, I don't know, randomly breaking into animated sequences? Uh, check and check. So, I watched it. And listen, I was hooked again. Even before the tentacles from God came and gave Rain Wilson's brain a cleaning. I can't show that, um, scene but you, you, should, you, should watch, you, should, you should watch the movie. This movie was off the wall and loud and odd and nerdy and angry, just like I was. But the true beauty of the movie came in the humanity of its characters. And quite honestly, the ending to Super is very high up on my favorite movie endings of all time. And I was so happy that it just existed. I am happy that it just exists. I soon became accustomed to the man who wrote and directed the movie. You guessed it, James Gunn. Also, in Super, sorry, real quick tangent. In Super, James Gunn plays a demon in a Bible study kids show named Demon's Will, and he does this, <laughs> He does this thing where he flails his tongue around in between sentences and it <laughs> and it just kills me. Like why why is he doing that? Why 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 do I love it so much? Look at him. Look at him go. I then watched Slither, his 2006 small town body horror zombie sci-fi comedy movie, and I freaking loved every bloody gory second of that. I wanted to watch everything James Gunn had made or even worked on. Funnily enough, I uh, had actually already seen both live-action Scooby-Doo movies, but I was like, I don't know, four, so I don't really remember any complex thoughts about them besides, yeah, this is on. You know, how, how four-year-olds think. James Gunn was also part of a movie that I was very intrigued by called Movie 43. Um, I don't know if you've seen Movie 43, but oh my god. This movie came out when I was about 14, and I honestly didn't think there was a line I wasn't willing to cross as a teenager in terms of watching movies, and when I saw a movie 43, I found that line. All the movie is is a series of short comedy skits, each written and directed by a different person, all starring A-list actors, which sounds impressive, but, um, I, I, uh, you know, it... The movie definitely exists. Um, James Gunn directed a sequence in the movie about a girl trying to fight off her boyfriend's gay cat. And um, that's all I have to say about this movie. Now, before we move on, I have to mention something. I can't continue this essay about Mr. James Gunn without talking a little bit about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You see, me and this multi-billion dollar franchise have a very interesting history in terms of my enjoyment of it. I adored the early years of the MCU because, as I said, I love superheroes and most things superhero-related, and Iron Man, The Incredible Hulk, and The Avengers were, at the time, the only movies I had ever seen the day they released in theaters. I will get more in-depth with my thoughts on the MCU in another video, but for right now, all I will say is that I loved, and love, the early MCU movies. But when I saw Guardians of the Galaxy, my brain was shook. 
The colors, the humor, the music, the charm, the style, the action, the pizzazz. It all clicked so well and creeped its way so deep into everything I love in media so much that my heart couldn't help but fall not only in love with the movie itself, but in love with media all over again. Guardians of the Galaxy had proven to me that the things I loved were shared in the world. That I wasn't wrong for wanting to watch these movies that no one had heard of. And not only now were they being made more, but they were being made at this scale, with this budget. My heart could not be happier. And when Guardians of the Galaxy 2 came out, everyone was raving about how amazing, funny, and well-made it was. Actually, uh, my, 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 my friend Darian, who um, is still the only person who I thought had better taste than me, told me that Guardians 2 was being released as James Gunn's director's cut, meaning that nothing was cut out from the movie, and this got my hopes even higher, so with excitement, I actually went to see Guardians 2 with Darian and uh, a few other Mamma Jammas, and my thoughts were positive, but with a sprinkle of disappointment. I loved it. I loved it for all the same reasons that I loved the first movie. Some moments I enjoyed even more, but I felt like the movie maybe pushed my limits of enjoyment to a point that confused me. The reason I was so confused was because on paper, this movie had everything I wanted the things I watched to have, but I still felt a tinge every time I tried to dig any deeper into that thought. Like my brain was trying to reject the notion that I couldn't enjoy something I had felt I should have. And I'll tell you now what I couldn't tell myself then. I like limitations. I love the idea of pushing restraint, of feeling like you're being pushed against. I love the idea of climbing up a mountain with no way to see the top, the, the struggle, the, the challenge, the fight you endure to get something you want done, done. I know it's cliche, but I romanticize the idea that pressure creates diamonds. And the interesting thing is that in order for there to be pressure, there has to be resistance. Something has to not want you to succeed. A limitation has to be set. The mountain doesn't want you to climb it. The studio doesn't want you to make your movie. The people around you don't want to listen to your opinion, but you do it. You make it. You say it because you want it to be done. You struggle. You fight. And against all odds, against all the negative feedback, you do it. You succeed. You achieve what you want at the scale you wanted. You've reached the mountaintop. I don't like to speculate on this channel. I especially don't like to speculate on things I know I can't know, so I will say this next part as a semi-metaphor. I feel like Guardians of the Galaxy was successful against a few odds. Not all odds. The, the MCU was seriously killing it during this time, and tongue-in-cheek dialogue had become a staple, but the movie seemed to be so personal to James Gunn. Like, he was the face of the creation. And after its uproarious success, the pressure was off. The MCU had released four monster box office hits in between Guardians 1 and Guardians 2. People were going to see it regardless of the quality. He could make Guardians 2 however he wanted, and people would have still shown up in the theaters. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I don't know where you live, but where I was, everyone I knew was excited to see Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Dang it, I keep rhyming. I'm going to try and stop, but it's like really a problem. But the anticipation, it didn't feel like, ooh, how are they going to follow it up? Oh, they got to do it better this time. It felt like, aw, sick. I'm happy the first one existed, and now I'm even more happy a second one will exist. It felt like James Gunn wasn't given any reins for Guardians 2, and he was free to do what he wanted with the movie, while, of course, sticking to and adhering with the parameters of Disney's sensibilities and guidelines. Again, I don't know that, and I can't know that. But what I do know is that I felt like those reins gave the first movie humanity. And when they were gone, it didn't feel as human anymore. Like, when you're too big to fail, there are no stakes. No life-changing reward prize, just something you knew would happen 
happens. And again, I think the movie itself is genuinely well made. Everything about it just sparkles, but maybe it sparkles too much? Also, I'm not a movie critic. I'm not even a game critic. I think that I like to watch and experience almost anything, and sometimes I find things that I wouldn't like to watch and experience again. And that's as far as things go in my head. And, and if you love something, who cares if other people don't? And if you don't love something, who cares if other people do? I don't think that other people's opinions should affect what you know, especially what you know about the things you love. Uh, that all being said, if you're curious, I did kind of feel the same way about the Suicide Squad, and kinda is the, the key word there. New studio, more blood and gore, they can say the cuss words now, uh, there'd be more pressure, potentially. It's funny, the Suicide Squad feels a lot more like Slither and Super than Guardians, but I think I resonate with Guardians more in my head. I don't, I don't exactly know what that means, but, but it feels right to say. It's very weird uh, writing about my opinions on things in these videos because you'd think that I don't like these things with the way I speak about them, or at least that's how it feels to say what I'm saying. But, but honestly, I find something I enjoy in everything I watch, and I love 99% of both of those movies. Uh, also, Peacemaker, no notes. Mwah. That, 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 that show had me at its opening dance number. The one thing that I love and always will love about James Gunn's work is that it's weird. It's off the wall. People say very off color, wild things. There are so many moments in his work that spoke and speak to me still. And I think my favorite trope or, or I guess tool that James Gunn uses is the heartfelt moments in all the things he makes. Usually these moments appear near the end of uh, the movies or TV shows, but, but without fail, they always hit so hard. It's like the movie plays a character within itself. Like we root for the movie because it's so weird and audacious and boisterous that we as the audience want the movie itself to live up to that potential. And then it shocks us with raw emotion. And I don't, just mean the character's raw emotion. I mean the whole of everything in the movie coming together to give us something special right before it leaves us. And I think these moments work so well because the thing we're watching is as weird as it is. These endings hit so hard because we think that we're watching comedies disguised as dramas, but in reality we're watching the opposite. And I think that that's beautiful. I love the idea that there is humanity in the misunderstood, because I feel like we all resonate and relate to the outcasts, the underdogs, the weird kids until we become one. Cause I think we all want to be seen or to be understood by someone. When I was a child and, and no one wanted to hang out with me because of how weird I was and because I talked about things that other people didn't like. It took me years to come to the conclusion that no one can fully understand someone else. But it's the act of trying that makes us care about them. And one of the tragedies of the world is that most people refuse to try. I, I don't want to preach in my videos. I, I don't think I'm more right about any one thing than any other person. And I, and I hope that I don't come off that way. I'm, I'm just telling you how I feel and I thank you for listening. Um, so, uh, let's bring all this back to Lamp Pill Chick Mart. When we look at, at James Gunn's body of work, it's no surprise that uh, this game is what it is. I mean, the dude started his career with trauma, and I don't know if you know what trauma is, but uh, you should Google it. Um, this game is, is a very clear reflection of what all these movies had to say, and it fits maddeningly well in the weird, beautiful James Gunn pantheon. Also, not to end this bonus essay on a side note, but there's uh, actually this promotional video for uh, Lolly Loop Train Claw uh, with a live action person as Juliet and it's played like an infomercial. And I promise I will pay whatever amount of money I have to to get my hands on this prop carton of Zombie Gun. Um, well, this has been fun. Uh, uh, bonus essay complete. Oh, back to the video. Um, this is gonna be a very interesting section. Also, 
fair warning, I'm going to use that word a lot. It's going to be interesting because, as I keep mentioning in this essay, uh, Lid Slip Tree Paw is not a very deep game. But the more I say that, the more I wonder what exactly that means to be deep. When I think of depth, especially in media, I picture something that is more than itself. Something that speaks without having to say much. In contrast, it seemed that Outlast had so much hidden beneath, but not much on the surface. And this game has the exact opposite problem. Since this section is me trying to delve into the themes of the games I cover, I decided to really try and dig. So I started thinking about it. I thought about it for a long time. And what's really funny is that in my thought, I've been amazed that this game perfectly solidifies such a very specific time in my life. And through that lens, I found some unifying themes that I'm more than happy to discuss for a minute or two. The more I played this juvenile game, the more I felt like a 13 year old just playing a video game right after school. Believe me, there were times when I felt like an adult human trying to finish this game for a philosophical completion for his very weirdly complicated YouTube channel. But that's neither here nor there. Usually how it goes when I play these games is the themes just jump out to me. Like, oh. I noticed a thing here, or there seems to be a running theme there, but really I could only find two themes that made me feel like I could talk about for more than a couple of sentences. Well, let's call it two themes, it's actually three, but, but we'll get into that when we get into that. I noticed some things that I think are worth mentioning briefly, like how all the dark purveyors use instruments to do their evil doing, and how everyone is dressed like a different band or singer from a different time period, but I mean... I don't know, that doesn't feel like a real talking point. It's it's like uh, that dedicated fandom wiki writer talking about how each dark purveyor represented another insecurity Swan had. I just I, I just don't see it. Lollyprim Chainclaw doesn't seem to have an arching metaphor that I really want to cover or uncover. Pun not intended. Uh, I feel like a, a broken record when talking about it, but, but really that's all I can say. So um, without further ado. The first of the themes is zombies. You know what? Let's let's talk about zombies here for a little bit of a second. You see, Lima Bean Checkout was released in 2012, and I don't know if you remember the insane zombie craze of the late 2000s to mid 2010s, but they were huge. From The Walking Dead, both comic book and show, to the endless video games, to a mad resurgence in zombie movies with box office monsters like Zombieland, best selling literature like World War Z, and the movie adaptation, even frickin' musicals like Zombie Prom. Okay, so, uh, full transparency, uh, Zombie Prom was actually first released in 1993, so maybe it's not as topical as I imply here. Uh, I just saw Zombie Prom at a national theater competition in high school, and yes, of course, I went to national theater in high school. Uh, it's just a rad musical that, uh, happens to deal with zombies, and I, and I just wanted to... I just wanted to mention it here. But regardless of topical relevance or not, zombies were in Minecraft, so they were pretty popular. The zombie genre had become so played with that we got satires like Cabin in the Woods, which is much more of a broad spectrum horror movie satire, but it's going on the list anyway. Paranorman, a zombie movie for the kids, even though from what I remember, that movie had some mad, crazy, dark moments in it. Uh, uh, we had Warm Bodies, a movie that is good no matter what my manhood says. I can like rom-coms. There's even zombies in this one. My point is, zombies were everywhere. Get it? Like a, like a, like a swarm, like a, like, like the zombie craze was, was in fact like a zombie outbreak. You're welcome. Zombies and zombie media have been around for years, but this resurgence was a massive cultural phenomenon. When I was like 10, they had this thing in my hometown called Zombie Fest, where a giant group of people would gather downtown and dress like zombies. It became an annual event where the zombie horde did the thriller dance one year. Um, Another year, we got a bunch of zombie-related celebrities to come. Um, I actually knew the guy, well, Technically, my older brother knew the guy who ran the whole thing, so I was always doing behind-the-scene whatnots for the festival. Um, Weirdly enough, in in the later years of Zombie Fest, there would be uh, Christian protesters who thought that the mere idea of zombies was somehow against God because only God was allowed to resurrect the dead. 
I remember as a, a 14 or 15 year old looking at these protesters and being so confused, like, zombies are, are just rad, you know? How could, more so, why could someone be so against the idea of a zombie apocalypse besides the obvious reasons? Um, but sadly, in, in 2018, uh, they, they, they stopped doing Zombie Fest, and, and it kind of just faded into obscurity. Um, I'm not really sure why. I mean, I stopped going in, like, in, like, 2016. Um, maybe, maybe that's why people, people like me, uh, there seemed to be a theme of things like that in my hometown. Uh, people from where I was from just, just stopped doing things after a while. Uh, there really, there really aren't a, a lot of hard traditions or recurring practices besides that of the religious. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe, maybe those, maybe those protesters got what they want. I kick ass for the Lord! Um... Uh, but, but I, I think I, I think I covered my views on that in, the, uh, pretty well in the, in the Outlast videos, so. Anyway, back to zombies. Uh, zombie media as a whole has always been very, very close to my heart, because in a very odd way, it seems that higher up executives in TV, movies, comic books, when it comes to zombies, they seem to look the other way in terms of violence. Uh, even in the ancient times when everything was censored, and by that I mean the 1980s, Zombies have always seemed to hold strong and given us bloodlusted freaks the gory goodness we've always wanted and looked for. I kick ass for the Lord! In search for this exact part of the video, it seems that zombies have a 10 to 12 year break from popularity when it comes out of the patchwork again and, and become hyper popular, um, which I just found like a like a very interesting thing. Like, like every decade or so, it, zombies just seem to rise in popularity. Uh, also, saving the best for last. We can't forget about the zombie-related anime that came out during this time. Lollipop Chainsaw went so hand-in-hand -hand with a lot of these anime that a huge portion of the costumes you collect are from these characters. Uh, I didn't watch a lot of zombie-related anime during this time. I, I think I was too hyper-focused on... I, I, don't, I don't know, other stuff, I guess. It was a weird time for me. I think the zombie fixation is, is very apparent in this game. I mean, when the zombies start coming for everyone, no one asks what they are or what they want. They all just know that they're zombies. And I think it's really neat that there's been an interesting resurgence with zombie media in South Korea lately. There's some really good zombie movies uh, coming from there. There's just some really good movies coming from there. Hold on, let me, let me, let me check my notes. Yep, yep, zombie fest. Uh, yeah, gory goodness, uh, South Korea. Okay, we're good! Wait, 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 hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. I promise this isn't gonna get political or or topical or or I'm gonna take some alienating stance on anything about anything. I don't want this channel to be about opinions or views. I I just want it to be about video games, um, specifically my personal experiences with video games. I know that people find enjoyment in, in listening to other people who share similar opinions to theirs, uh, specifically when it comes to politics or philosophy. I am not that. I, I have many philosophies, yes, and I will share said philosophies, but I do not think mine are above or below anyone else's. I care way more about what is interesting to me than what is emotionally driving for others. With all that being said, I did say that we would talk about Juliet's overt sexuality. So, let's talk about it. Juliet is interesting in many, many ways. By that, I mean she is very clearly supposed to be sexualized, obviously. She uses stripper poles as tools uh, in her zombie slaughter, and luckily for everyone playing the game who's attracted to her, the game takes place on her 18th birthday, a sentiment that gets really weird when you think about it for more than three seconds. However, Juliet is also our main character. She is very clearly smart and kind, and she kicks an insane amount of zombie tush. And she is the one saving everyone else from zombies. She is the person we control in the story. The original title for this essay was Lollipop Chainsaw Gory Zombie Feminism, but I changed it 
because I couldn't justify having feminism in the title because I don't think this game holds a very definitive feminist philosophy at its core. It holds a much more fun-based ideal at its core in my eyes. To me, this game keeps screaming out, hey, don't think about it, have fun, kill zombies. And, and honestly, when I think of who this game is saying that to, I picture a bunch of boys. But what's really interesting is that the first person who ever talked to me about this game was a friend of mine named Maddie. Maddie was the coolest. We met in middle school and, and she was truly kind to me. This was especially meaningful because I was a very loud and very annoying kid. I, I wanted so much attention because I, I thought that if people were thinking about the crazy things I said, then they weren't thinking about how short I was or how I still looked like a six-year-old. I mean, I've always uh, uh, been short and it's always been a problem. Like, uh, like I was exactly 36 inches tall. That's about one meter for my metric viewers until I was 12. And when I was in seventh grade, I grew to four foot, five inches, 1.3 meters. And then finally I grew to five foot, two inches, 1.5 meters a few months later. And that is where I stand today. Uh, middle school is, and was, a mess. But Maddie was rad. Actually, th there's a really embarrassing story connotative to Maddie. Uh, um, uh, real quick. Uh, you see, me and Maddie were in theater together, and I had just gotten my first phone, a Samsung Intensity 2. Oh my god, what a phone. And I didn't really have um, anyone's number besides my mom's, but Maddie, out of the kindness of her heart gave me her number and took a picture of herself for the contact photo. Um, now, I am notorious for losing my phone because I am really bad about putting it somewhere and then just forgetting about it. I can remember every single moment of any scene in Parks and Rec, but I couldn't tell you where my phone is even if it was literally in front of me. And that's true for back then and true for now. The point is, I, I, I lost my phone in the theater class and, and the kids find it, but they don't know whose it is. And this is before the time of lock screens. So everyone goes through the phone and all that's on the phone is one picture of Maddie. I then tell everyone that it's mine and everyone starts looking at me weird. Presumably they, they, they thought I was some sort of stalker and I feel so embarrassed for about a billion reasons, but but Maddie, who was insanely popular, mind you, stepped in to, to clear the situation. Like I said, Maddie was rad. And me and Maddie stayed friends after that. And one day, Maddie and I were having this conversation about video games, and I was of the stance that girls don't play video games, but Maddie said I was wrong and she could prove it. Uh, she told me about her and her friend Taylor, also a girl, play and love this game called Lollipop Chainsaw. So. Not only did she destroy my argument with herself as an example, but she also planted the seed in my head to play this very game and make this very video. And I can't prove it, but I think that the game invited her to play it because she could play as a girl. Not only could she play as a girl, but she could kill zombies as a girl. People in the game needed her help and she could save them. You could argue that, that she could have played Metroid, for example, because Samus is a girl, but Samus is in a full metal suit for 90% of the entire series, so anyone could imagine anything is under there. I think that Maddie and Taylor liked seeing themselves in the character of Juliet. And this next part, by the way, may sound like a joke, but I promise it's true. I have never really understood representation in movies or, or media. I, I mean, I've played a thousand games, and I've seen a thousand movies, read a thousand books, and I was always more into the story than into the characters because I, I, I couldn't relate to the characters because because the characters were handsome and tall or they were powerful and, and strong and, and I was never any of those things. I mean, I honestly related more to monsters in movies like like Godzilla or, or Frankenstein or, or King Kong because they were so misunderstood by the world at large that they were attacked for it. That made sense to me. But in the final moments of Lollipop Chainsaw, Nick gets his life back and he 
runs up to Juliet, and and he discovers that he's in uh, Morikawa Sensei's body, and he's shorter than Juliet. And as I watched this scene, I discovered to my surprise that this moment made me tear up. I know, I know, I know. It's really, really dumb. It. I believe me. I understand how dumb it is, but I had. I had never seen that in any media before. I had never seen a short guy kiss a pretty girl at the end of the story. And again, I've seen a lot of things. Short guys are the bad guys, the weirdos, the 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 outcasts. They're the the side characters, not the main characters. And yes, it may have been meant for laughs and it was supposed to look ridiculous in Lollipop Chainsaw, but it meant so much for me to see that unobscured a short guy kiss laugh and love a pretty girl in a multi-million dollar piece of entertainment and i didn't even know that i wanted to see it i i didn't think it was possible honestly but but i imagine that 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 is how maddie and taylor felt playing the same game i think that's huge but also, for all I know, they could have just liked slicing up dead freaks as much as the next boy. So it's, who knows? Who knows? I don't. Maddie and I uh, stayed friends for many years until high school when we, we, we just drifted apart, you know, as many adolescent friendships do. I hope she's doing well. I really hope she's doing well. Uh, Maddie, if you, if you see this, um, I want you to know something really important. Um, I got you and another girl confused when when uh, Dylan asked me if I knew you and, and I may have said some really mean things about that other girl but I thought that he was talking about her not you uh, her name is also Maddie hence my confusion but but if you don't know what, what I'm what I'm talking about um, then 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 don't worry about it and thank you for all your kindness. I, I talked about how I could only find two themes worth talking about, and there was actually three, and that I'd explain later when we get there. Uh, well, we're there. Um, if you haven't noticed, I try to structure these videos very specifically, as in each part of the essay has its own reason for being there, and I've, and I've always saved the fourth part of the essay for something special, like a specific thing I want to discuss in accordance to the game in question specifically. Uh, in Outlast, it was insane mode because of how incredibly difficult it was to finish, but with uh, Lollipoop, I I wanted to actually do another bonus essay. I know, I know, I know, two bonus essays for the price of one. That's that's uh, that's what you can expect from here at, at Just a Video Boy. Uh, essays and, and lots of them. Quality may vary. Again, Oliver told me not to do this. <laughs> so, so you know what, you know what, this essay, this next essay is dedicated to you, Oliver. Stay till the end, you weirdo. You'll see. Oliver, Oliver, you're 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 an amazing. You you nerdy nerdy wee boy. <sighs> okay. Is the audience ready? The editor, are you ready? Am I ready? Oliver, are you ready? Okay. All right. Bonus essay part two. Maybe it's the noise. Maybe it's the ease of with which destruction is introduced. Maybe it's the unstoppable inevitability of evisceration. Whatever it is, chainsaws have haunted our dreams for decades. Dude, aren't they so freaking cool? I genuinely don't know what it is with chainsaws, but but every time a chainsaw shows up in anything, I literally shriek with glee. Uh, th this chapter slash bonus essay is, is going to be a lot more freeform than uh, the other stuff because all I really want to do is is look at, talk about, and just praise chainsaw media in general. Um, because I, I I don't think this. Um, ring-based cutting tool gets its due diligence when being discussed, and and is 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 this really just a half-baked excuse to talk about some other things that I love that happen to deal with chainsaws? Uh, uh, why why yes yes it is, but this is also uh, my channel, and if you don't want to travel in chainsaw glory with me, uh, then good day, sir. Uh, uh, I said good day. 
Uh, so here we go. I've talked many, many times about my virtual bloodlust as a child, but there has always been something about the chainsaw that introduces such a beautiful cacophony of terror and excitement. I think the first movie to ever use a chainsaw in a manner not befitting its intended use was the 1970 shock slock splatter film, The Wizard of Gore, which, uh, by the way, is mentioned in the movie Juno. R remember, 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 remember when I mentioned Juno, like, like three chapters ago, they, they, they watched The Wizard of Gore in Juno. Anyway, I've never seen The Wizard of Gore, but it, it looks so corny that I that I, I may have to check it out. However, I do know that people get uh, dismembered, mutilated, and other fun whatnots in it. W when talking about uh, fake violence, uh, which by the way, uh, content warning, because this chapter is, is gonna get like neck deep in fantasy violence. I've only ever seen two reactions from movie slash video game violence and other people. Uh, one being disgust, as in as in the person doesn't want to see it or they like look away, and the other being pure joy at the mere thought, much less the sight. Uh, I obviously fall into the latter category because something about it, uh, it just just it just makes the child in me happy. I don't think uh, chainsaws became very mainstream scary uh, until a little movie uh, you may have heard of it called. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, what can I say that hasn't already been said and re-said, parodied, laughed at, and, and just watched over and over and over again? If you want to have a conversation on the weird, then look no further than all the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies put together. They are wild and in every movie they seem to try and one up the chainsaw antics with a little more panache each time. I mean in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, they cut a car in half whilst moving down the highway. If that isn't a party, I don't know what is. I think after the initial Texas Chainsaw Massacre series, there was a massive boom of just chainsaw related horror movies, uh, but the next franchise I really want to talk about is the Evil Dead. I don't have children, but if I did, I don't think I would love them as much as I love the Evil Dead series. I don't remember the first time I saw the Evil Dead movies, but I do remember the first time I introduced them to other people. You see, I have a little sister, and uh, she has friends, wild, I know. Uh, one time she invited a bunch of her friends over to have a small party or whatever, and, and they couldn't figure out what they wanted to watch, and so I suggested that uh, we all watch a little movie called The Evil Dead, and uh, as the horror on these teenagers' faces slowly turned to disgust, then terror, then back to disgust, oh my god, everything in my life up to that moment was so worth it. Because sharing the wild insanity that is The Evil Dead is a gift that you can only give someone else. And the sequel is literally bigger, bloodier, and bombastic-er than the first one could ever be. Our main character cuts off his possessed hand and, and, and builds himself a brand new chainsaw hand in which he uses to stab a giant evil demon in order to suck it into a wormhole. What? Wh what? Uh, whoever could have thought of such an amazing thing, I, I thank you every day and every night. I've had many, many conversations with friends and other people regarding the Army of Darkness. Uh, one of them actually being uh, Darian, that, that, that amazing uh, boy I, I mentioned earlier, and, 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 and I will definitely talk about Darian again in the future, but uh, I, had a, I had a really amazing friend uh, growing up uh, before Darian, who, who would talk to me endlessly about things like this. His name was, his name was Kyle. And, and me and Kyle at least had a dozen conversations about Army of Darkness. And, and, and what I didn't know is that apparently the third movie is regarded as the low point in the series. And, and while the movie is a lot more cartoony and a lot less bloody than the other two, I, I still have a very big soft spot for all its ridiculous scenarios. So I, I, I like it. But the Evil Dead remake... Oh, sweet baby blood. That movie is on some different sauce because it is a wild ride and a half. Every 
single death, every single character, every single sequence of this movie is so freaking metal that I think Vikey would watch it and go, yeah, that's that's a little too metal for me, bub. I love the remake because I could still feel the over-the-top, ridiculous nature of the originals. But it, it wasn't played for laughs this time. It was played so, so seriously. And I think the amazing thing is that it just still works. The, the movie still works so well. And and I just, uh, just oh, oh, thank you, Evil Dead. The Evil Dead remake was also the first movie I remember to, to do that trope in YouTube videos where where it'd be like don't hit the skip button don't hit the skip button and, and i remember as like a 13 year old that was like whoa i i haven't i haven't seen the tv show i'm 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 sorry oh my god this section really is just a top 10 list without any organization uh god moving on uh 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 i don't want to talk i don't want to talk too much about about video games in this little chainsaw celebration because obviously any game i talk about will eventually have its own essay, so I, I find it kind of useless to mention any of them here, so so let's just stick to uh, movies and other media. Um, I'm saving the big one for, for last, so let's see, what, let's see what else we got. You know what? Let's talk about chainsaws and zombie movies. I feel like that's a fitting topic for a fitting section. You know, if you don't count Dead Alive, or Brain Dead, depending on where you're from, the scene where he uses a lawnmower to kill all the zombies in his house, I mean, lawnmower the chainsaw kind of the same deal and honestly now that i'm trying to think about it i really can't think of any chainsaw zombie movie deaths there's 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 dead snow of course what a what a spectacular german movie uh, uh dead snow is a movie about a bunch of german researchers i think i'm not sure i'm going purely by memory here uh and they discover a bunch of zombie nazis and and at one point uh, uh, two Russian dudes fight off a horde of zombie SS with a chainsaw and a hammer while German pop music plays in the background and, and the whole movie is that good. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any chainsaws in Zombieland, uh, which means that it gets a zero out of any chainsaws on the ranking list. Uh, oh, let me see my, let me see my notes. Uh, were there any chainsaws in the Resident Evil movies? I remember, I remember a dude gets, gets cut in half. No, wait, 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 that was a giant, that was a giant knife hammer, never mind. Uh, there are chainsaws in other Resident Evil stuff, but we're not talking about video games. Man, maybe I overestimated the chainsaw's importance in zombie movies. Well, eh, live and learn. Before we move on, let me tell you a story. A chainsaw-related story. Uh, I'd hope most stories I, I'm going to tell in the future are are chainsaw related, but my love for the weird uh, has obviously persisted my entire life, and and my want to share this love has really persisted because, you know, I, I just want people to see how cool some things are. Uh, anyway, so I'm in college, a, a place that I would not, um, a place that I, I wouldn't stay for very long, but but at the time this story takes place, I'm, I'm still there. You see, I have a very tuned ear to any media I think would fit my fancy, and I especially have a tuned ear to Nicolas Cage movies. Nick Cage needs no introduction. Uh, there are very few Nicolas Cage movies that I don't enjoy watching over and over again, because every time I see that handsome, manly hunk of man just go for it, I'm there enjoying every second with him. Uh, I can officially say that Nick Cage is definitely the equivalent of a chainsaw in man form. So, uh, uh, college me is sitting there in an empty storage room or wherever I happen to find myself during those times, and I see a trailer for a new movie. Oh. My Cage. Dude, with the, with the blood and the and the colors and the Nick Cage and at, and at the end Chainsaw's battle? To battle but Chainsaw but Nick Cage Nick Cage Chainsaw battle? Sold. But 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 the neatest thing uh, about this already neat movie is that it was going to be released on DVD and Blu-ray, meaning that I can watch it as soon as it comes out, which just so happened to be a short while away. An idea popped itself into my brain. I'm going to have a movie watching party and I'm going to invite everyone I know, which is like six people. And we're all going to sit and we're all going to watch this movie and we're all going to howl. We're going to laugh and darn it. We're going to cheer our heads off while Nick Cage owns a fool in a chainsaw duel. That one was on purpose. So the night arrives. 
Uh, all six of the people I know pile into my parents' basement. Um, I make a pile of popcorn. I have a freshly bought, unopened Blu-ray. I peel away the plastic. I open the casing. A signature crack sings its way through my mom's freshly vacuumed rug. I popped the disc from its sanctuary. I could feel the touch of God in the glean from the reflection. Real life magic was hidden somewhere in this Blu-ray. I should mention, uh, everyone I invited was not as hyped as I was for this movie. Uh, they were all relatively normal folk. One of them was Cody, who was who was no stranger to, to, to watching wild stuff with me. For further information, watch my video on Outlast 2. But the other innocents in the room had had no blood to their name. They they hadn't been christened by the baptism of the bashful. Uh, the, the, the sincerity of the severe. The obscurity of the obscured. The movie started. I was, I was half watching the movie and half watching them and they were not hooked. <laughs> they were, they were confused a little upset, and they asked a lot of questions. And as the movie went on and got wilder and wilder, I'm, I'm talking BDSM biker assassins, LSD face transitions, Nick Cage toilet screaming, I was in heaven, and they were in some small weirdo's parents' basement. But as it went on, they started to expect the absurd, and they started to revel in the wild, and they all started to slowly see my point of view. And before we all knew it, all six of us were piled onto my parents' small couch, hooting and hollering as Nick Cage shoved a metal spike down a bald dude's throat. Then it happened. A buff, Swedish man pulls out an overtly long chainsaw and Mr. Cage pulls out his own overtly long chainsaw and a chainsaw fight ensues. It is everything we want it to be. It's bloody and crazy and it is as loud as we are. The movie ended uh, about 10 to 15 minutes after that and we were all satisfied. Well, they were still reeling from the thematic emotional whiplash that had befelled them, but I was satisfied. I wish I could tell you that we did that again. Um, that we had many, many more nights like that one. Uh, but sadly, we didn't. Shortly after, I, I dropped out of college, and I ripped any chance of talking to those people again away from myself. I think that, on that note, it's time to get into the big one. The big one that I think everyone wants this chainsaw section to be about. Let's talk about Chainsaw Man. Uh, I'm being genuinely honest when I tell you that there are a few things I love, like, and, and just fully appreciate more than Chainsaw Man. Funnily enough, the, the person who introduced me to Chainsaw Man was the same person who told me not to put this here section in this here video, and, and that beautiful man's name is Oliver. Oliver has exquisite taste in all things, uh, video games, movies, manga, comics. Uh, Oliver has an indistinguishably large collection of Transformers. Oliver also is the luckiest person I have ever met when it comes to finding obscure gems in used book slash video game stores. He's also single, so. Me and Oliver uh, have been trading recommendations back and forth with each other for the better part of four years now, and Oliver has never disappointed in any recommendation. Oliver tells me one day to, to read this weird little manga called Chainsaw Man. Uh, he tells me that it's been selling out and it is maddeningly hard to get your hands on a copy. Uh, he was also reluctant to let me borrow his volume one copy because, uh, because he let me borrow his, his uh, monster omnibus volume one. And, and I accidentally uh, uh, bent the back of it and, and I had to buy him a new one. I'll always be sorry for that. But long story short, he eventually let me borrow Chainsaw Man Volume 1. And I read it and I was puzzled. I remember liking it, but I, it didn't give me a very powerful reaction in either direction. It, it just felt like, I, it, I just felt like I was floored. L like, like Denji 
doesn't solve problems by outsmarting his opponents. He doesn't train more than them. He, he just simply tries to hit them harder. Uh, uh, all he really wants is to get with this girl who pretty much owns him and, and he constantly butts heads with his roommate slash commanding officer slash sort of best friend, but I, I stuck with it. Uh, eventually, I had to shell out thirty dollars to get a copy of Chainsaw Man One, and 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 then I started buying them at the same time Oliver did. Every time a new volume was released, we would just buy it together, and I got more and more excited as each volume was announced. Because as I kept reading, I could feel myself getting more invested as the story grew, and and as the characters grew, as as the stakes grew, I started to fall in absolute love with the entire thing as a whole. I, I started to relate to and, and understand what everyone was going through. I, I started to, to, to see a little portion of myself in all these beings. And, and the one thing I related to most in, in the world of Chainsaw Man was the fear. The violence in Chainsaw Man's world is palpable. But everyone in the story is so used to it and, and understands the stakes that life basically has no meaning to them. Except when they discover what they mean to each other. Dang it, that, that one wasn't, that wasn't intentional. I could feel it every time something they didn't want to happen happens. And, and it's like their world just sinks further and everything just gets worse. And believe me, in Chainsaw Man, Everything always gets worse. There are moments in Chainsaw Man's story where you think that everyone has hit absolute rock bottom, but then the floor drops and everyone realizes that their time is numbered and those numbers are not very high. And every character in this story is so beautifully colored and intricate, but 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 surprisingly, I initially judged our, our main boy wrong. Denji has had such an insanely rough life that he doesn't want any complicated goals or ambitions. He just wants the bare minimum because the world couldn't even give him that. And this girl who he falls for is so obviously smarter and more dangerous than he could ever realize that he doesn't see past her until it's too late. At the center of it all is the thing that has taken over Denji's heart the chainsaw devil itself the scariest most blood hungry devil of them all i find it so difficult to talk about these stories because when i read them a part of my heart breaks i wanted so badly to have friends like these experiences like these powers like these and, and feeling it secondhand has always just been a shattered illusion to me the story is so explosive and energetic at times, but most of the time it's slow and it reels you in. And those are the moments that I love. I love it when all the dust settles and we just hang out with these characters in this world for as long as we can. And I, I definitely wasn't alone in this feeling because Chainsaw Man blew up. Everyone was reading and talking about it. Volumes were selling out hours after they were released. In between the releases of volume six and seven, I actually decided to read Tetsuki Fujimoto's other manga, Fire Punch. And um, uh, here's my two sentence thoughts on that. Uh, I loved it until I didn't. And I, I don't understand the tree. What's really interesting to me is that is that Fujimoto actually released a one shot in, in July of, of 2020, just before Chainsaw Man went back into publication, um, called Just Listen to the Song. The, the one chapter manga isn't that long, and it, it follows a high school boy who awkwardly loves a girl, and he decides to write her a song uh, and release it online for her to watch, but it accidentally gets globally famous. Uh, people start speculating uh, of what the song's deeper meaning is and, and whether or not you can see ghosts or aliens in it, if it's a coded message. And, and, and the boy is just so bummed out because it isn't that complicated. 
he, he just he just wants people to take the song for what it is and he didn't even want them to see it in the first place i i can't help but hope uh that this is uh fujimoto talking about how he feels towards uh chainsaw man's success and again i'm not here to speculate uh, uh even though that's exactly what i'm doing but I, I I just can't help but wonder if he if he just wants people to take Chainsaw Man for what it is. A story about a weird guy saving the world in a weird way. And I love that because a weird guy showed me a manga about a weird guy written by a weird guy for weird guys like me. And I would like to thank all those weird guys for that. Especially, especially that Transformer nerd watching this video. Thank you, buddy. I honestly think that that's what unifies everyone's love in Chainsaw Man. It's so weird and so unflinchingly so that, that we all can't help but relate to it. And I can't help but see that same weirdness in Lollipop Chainsaw. Excuse me, Lolly Saw Chain Pop. When I look at these two spectacular pieces of media. I see two amalgamations of things that two people love. And I see the world enjoying them with them. I think that that truly is the beauty of being weird. Knowing that in the strange, in the awkward, in the juvenile, we aren't alone because we can see a part of ourselves in it. I think it's time to give this game a proper goodbye, don't you? Dear Lollipop Chainsaw, thank you for being weird. Thank you for being and doing exactly what you wanted, how you wanted. And, and thank you for taking me along for the ride. I, I promise I won't hold back your lack of complexity against you, and I promise to always keep your wildness in mind, especially when making things like, I don't know, a video about quitting video games by playing video games. I thank you for your sweet and savory gameplay and all the heads that went pop along the journey. I especially appreciate the mayhem and the generally chaotic nature of literally mowing down zombies with reckless abandon. Sometimes you just gotta sit back and destroy things to really put a smile on your face. Thank you for showing me a story that throws everything at the wall. And especially thank you for having the short guy get the girl at the end. I gotta say, reveling in the Utra with you has brought a light back to my heart that I had forgotten was there. And I love to think of these memories that have come forth with joy instead of sadness. Because usually when I think about them, they make me feel more alone. But now that I think about them paired with you, I don't feel that way anymore and that really has meant a lot to me. Lollipop, you make me proud to be as weird as I am, and I hope that you shed that light onto anyone else who feels uncomfortable in their weirdness. I love that you are so unapologetic in how and why you do what you do, and I think that it might be healthy to adopt that mindset from time to time. Every time I sit down to write these essays or work on these videos, I have so much fear that people will think that they're too weird or too odd, just like how people felt like when I was a little kid, but you've shown me that it doesn't matter. Now I think that honesty in oneself will always be more important than the approval of others. Approval in either direction. My weirdness is mine, and mine alone. Lollipop Chainsaw, you showed me that I have to rip and tear my way through the hordes of comfortability, and to have fun doing it. Enjoy the challenge, enjoy the weird, because no one else is going to do it for me. I can sit back and be afraid and do nothing and live comfortable. Or I can go crazy, be weird, tear zombies in half, jump on Viking ships, go into hallucinations, fight alien robots and, and, and destroy giant Elvis. And I can come out of it with a smile on my face. Stay weird, Lollipop Chainsaw. Stay bloody, stay bright. Keep your color and your humor, and thank you for bringing out the best in me. With all the weirdness in my heart, just a video play.
great. So, uh, uh, there's another game to add to the list. Uh, how fun, how weird. Um, I'm happy Lollipop Chainsaw is done. Uh, and, and I think that I may have went a, 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 a little bit overboard with the extra material, but, but I had fun making it. I think that it, it was really, really worth the effort. Uh, and, and thank you for watching. It, 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 it's always going to be amazing to me that people watch my videos. And um, if you haven't played the game, I, I definitely think you should check it out. It's, it's a hoot and a half when it comes to everything. And, and, and I, I, I swear the ending hit me at an odd angle, like so off guard. Like seeing Nick be short and kiss Juliet was a sight to see. Also, wouldn't you, isn't like the rest of Nick's body going to be an old Japanese man's body from now on? You know what I mean? Like, is it, anyway. Look at these two beautiful people. Oh my God, Mazzy, Eve, you guys are the realest and the coolest. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you guys which one is which because, because you know, you know, you know, you know. Um, if you uh, also would like to support me on Patreon, then you can head over there and do that where I post exclusive essays and other interesting things. But if you don't, then that's okay too. Uh, regardless, thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting and, and honestly, thank you for everything. It is. It means an incredible amount to me. The video for next time is going to be a very fascinating one. Because next time, we're going to be checking out Limbo. Oh, but uh, always remember, this has been Lollipop Chainsaw, and I'm just a video boy. Have a good one.